All right, sir. Well, we've managed to take the point, but I'm afraid there's just thousands of them. This is going to be a mass combat. I don't know if we're going to survive or not. Let's see how the GM runs mass combat. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of mass combat. We're looking at, of course, the idea of how to simulate thousands or millions of warriors or combatants all engaged in the singular activity of trying to kill themselves. Now, mass combat is handled in various systems using large amounts of percentiles or roles. There's determinant factors. You can calculate in the average skill of the warriors versus the average skill of the defenders. The geography starts to become important and you factor in all of those. And by the end of the day, you've spent four hours trying to work out the outcome of something which should be bloody obvious to everybody anyway. And the outcome of that should very well be whatever it is that you want because you're in charge. But, yes, I know there should be consequences, there should be values, and there should be numbers. So, if you are hoping that this video on mass combat is going to give you the secret formula that you just plug in all of these values and out pops a d20 that you roll to determine who wins the battle or not, I'm afraid you are sorely disappointed because maths is not needed in large-scale combat, at least not in my opinion. Large-scale combat, for me, this is my equation. PC successes during the mass combat plus the narrative imperative that you want to drive forward equals the outcome of the combat. So in other words, if there are two armies fighting against one another, the PCs are on one side, they are doing successful little things, which I will cover shortly, and they have succeeded in all of them, then the outcome of the battle should be that the side that the PCs are on wins. Now, the rest is entirely up to you as to how that happens. Alternatively, if the PCs are failing at their tasks or not doing their tasks, then the outcome should be that the enemy wins. That's as simple and as complicated as it should get. But how do you make mass combat interesting? How do you make it so that it feels as if the PCs are, as a matter of fact, having an impact on the combat? And how does you make it feel as if the combat is moving backwards and forwards in the same kind of fluid way that it should under real circumstances? Well, that is what the subject of this video is about. Number one, it should always be player focused because otherwise the mass combat is simply a narrative backdrop. So just like walking through a forest, walking through a mass combat would simply be a descriptor in the background if the players are not involved. Now, how do you get the players involved? Well, the players can be involved by accident, the players can be involved by choice, the players could be involved by being hired by the local individual who's about to launch the campaign. If the players are running around in mechs, and uh, the local Star-Lord wants to take over a planet, he might hire the players to be part of a special task force that will be involved during the major battle. Or battles, depending. One doesn't necessarily think of or need to think of mass combat as a singular engagement. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't be a singular engagement. Very few battles were simply won in a single venture. Often there were lots of different things happening all over the place that contributed to the outcome, or the battle lasted for many, 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 many days and didn't turn into a siege. So there are different ways of running a mass combat. Ultimately, however, the players should always be involved, and they should always be involved in important things. Now, if you want the players to be involved and all they're doing is they're on latrine duty all the time, well, unless you're throwing in some kind of demon that happens to like latrines, you are wasting the player's time. The players need to be involved and your mass combat will only feel as mass and as combatty as you involve the players. Otherwise, like I said, it's just a descriptor. So how do you involve the players? Well, firstly, the planning and the uncovery of this major battle. Do the PCs arrive to find the general in an absolute state of panic because we've just learned that the enemy Tsinkethi are on their way with a thousand troops and four thousand cavalry as well as a damn dragon? We're in trouble. Now the PCs are involved. Now missions start to be delivered. Now missions start to form the backbone of your mass combat. If it is just free-for-all, 
then it doesn't matter whether there's one enemy or a thousand enemies. Your PCs are just hacking and slashing. And that's not entertaining in the slightest. That's literally just rolling dice against one another. And it can become very boring. If you don't have set outcomes for the PCs, if there isn't a set mission, however you want to disguise it, whether it is to get from one side of the battlefield to the other, deliver this message to the general. He must know that the ogres are attacking on the right flank. Now, suddenly, the combat that interposes between them and getting to the general now has a reason. It now has a purpose. So the more of that kind of stuff you can do, the better your mass combat will feel. If it's just a case of, oh, you see 100,000 uh, Klingon warriors arrayed on the battlefield in front of you. There's 100,000 of you. All right, roll initiative. Okay, now we start fighting. That's very boring. But if it's a case of, all right, you see on the left-hand side of the battlefield, there are several siege tanks. Now, those siege tanks are going to be raining fire down on your army for as long as possible before they engage. Those siege tanks need to be taken out. Right, now the players have got an objective. Now they can get there. Now they can start having combat with the defenders of those siege equipment. And when they take the siege equipment out or are forced to retreat because they can't, well, now they can look over the battlefield and see that the battlefield is not going exactly as they had planned. If they're successful, the siege is not, the siege equipment is not taking out troops. They can see that the enemy has started to become loose around the right hand side and that your troops seem to be taking advantage. On the other hand, if they have failed or if they've had to withdraw from destroying those siege uh, engines, now suddenly they can see, oh, the siege engine has completely obliterated the entire third wing of the cavalry and the cavalry is starting to crumble. They might need to get down there to help the cavalry just to store them up for a few moments. That's the second part, is you start to now link objectives together. So as the players succeed in one or fail in one, it now should lead naturally to the next one. And that's up to you how to link them. If the players have to fall back because they were uh, in, unsuccessful in taking their objective, or if the players were successful, excuse me, were successful, they now withdraw back to the general, who then says, "Well done on doing that. We've just received report, however, that Lady Catherine and her contingent are coming under some magical attack. We don't have any experience with that, and the soldiers are just being obliterated. But I'm sure that you do." You would be doing a great service if you were to go and save Lady Catherine from that magical attack. It could be something like that. It could be, we have discovered that there is a nebula directly next to the fleet that has engaged with the enemy. That nebula, we fear, will contain enemy ships which may be trying to gain position on us. If you were to take a small contingent into that nebula, you might discover them. You don't necessarily need to engage them, just find out where they are. And then we will open up that nebula like a giant can of exploding cans of exploding cans, whatever. So the idea is to engage the PCs, is to make them feel as if they're involved, but not just by killing stuff. Yes, every now and again, throw in this massive melee where they come running around the corner and there's 20 of their men and there's 80 of the enemy. And so they either have to go around and leave those 20 men or they charge in there and they start hacking them. Now, the idea is to keep it shifting. So sometimes there's combat, sometimes there's these kind of missions that maybe don't have any combat. The lack of combat can make the mass combat feel even bigger. Now, the reason for that is that they've had this massive combat, they've just defeated 20 of the opposition, and now they go on this mission where they actually are nowhere near the battlefield. But they're trying to rally support, or they're trying to do this, or they're trying to find that, or maybe they're just trying to hold a gate, and the enemy never comes anywhere near that gate. It's about creating a lull that calm in the middle of the storm, the eye of the storm. It's about making the players realize that not everything in during combat is violent. Having been part of several airsoft battles with significant number of people, the battles rage furiously. And then they sort of calm down as everyone takes stock of where they are. And there's a moment of pause almost. And then there's another furious engagement. You've got to try and bring that into your mass combat to make it feel real. People can only fight for maybe 30 minutes, especially if it's a heavy, hectic, intense battle. And then it will slow down as both sides need to literally catch their breath. 
you need to bring that into your game. So your mass combat, some frantic mass combat, then some pause. A side mission that involves finding a map or taking stock of something or making a map. Then more combat, intense combat, then not so intense combat. Now that leads me to why the maths isn't important. Now every single monster, every single alien, every single entity that one can fight against has got statistics. And it's got lots of statistics and all those statistics are designed to make the combat challenging for the characters and for the players. This is not, and I know this sounds contradictory, a mass combat is not about the combat. Because if you want to sit at your table and spend an hour just to run through one little combat so that your players can go and find a map and then spend another hour on another piece of combat and then spend another hour on another piece of combat, that will just become very dull and all it's going to feel like is that it's just this perpetual rolling of dice. Why are we doing this? This is not fun. So the monsters, the characters that the players need to encounter need to fall quickly. Now I'm not talking one hit point or one health point or one armor point type of creatures. Yes, have those. Have those where the players charge into a group of 20 and their first attack drops the first one, their second attack drops the second one, their third attack misses so they've got to attack that same one again. Make it feel epic. And then the next one they hit, he parries their blow and suddenly delivers back a huge amount of damage because this is the sergeant, this is the captain, this is the master, this is one of the uh, junior warriors that has some training. So there's a moment in that combat where it gets vicious. Or there's a monster that's brought in that makes the rest of the soldiers who literally you're hitting once or twice to make them go down, now there's this big monster that punctuates that mass combat. So again, it's about making it feel like there's lots of combat going on, but not making the combat the focus of the story. Because combat is really, unless you like crunching numbers, just dice rolling. There's very little room in there for the players to actually really get into the story. So exactly as you've got to make the mass combat ebb and flow in terms of action and then not action, action and then inaction, you've got to make the combats easy, but then sometimes terrifying as well. And it's that that will make it feel dramatic. Now, the other thing that's important, and this is the, the final idea in terms of mass combat, is the descriptions. You've got to talk about descriptions. Thousands of men are arrayed. You can see the terror in some of them. The youth are busy throwing up as this is their first battle. The veterans stand stoically, their faces grim and set as they run through their defensive katra and then their aggressive katra. Others are busy priming their weapons, making sure that their rifles are fully loaded and fully kitted. Here and there are little clusters of men speaking softly of sweethearts that they've left behind or speaking softly to their sweethearts as they f prepare to face this final battle. The idea is to literally build up the scale, build up the experience by making it individual. It will feel as if it's a mass combat if whilst the PCs are busy fighting, there's a young NPC who comes to try and help them, but then he gets killed by some random attack, and then they move on and there's a lieutenant that they have to help, or there's a king, or there's a uh, infiltrator, or there's a this or a that. By building up the story of the mass combat, Whatever the outcome, if the PCs are constantly failing in those missions or if they're ignoring those missions and they're just trying to engage in combat, they lose. Whether they're taken prisoner or whether they manage to escape out of a back route, it doesn't matter. They lose. And if they're succeeding at all of those missions, then it's up to you to still decide. And it needs to look as if everything that the PCs did has made a difference. It has made a difference. It really has impacted the way the battle is going. But, but the enemy is simply too great. The, the enemy is too overwhelming. It forces the PCs to withdraw. Now, what I do in those kind of situations is so that the PCs don't feel as if the GM has just spited them. Even though they did all this cool stuff, the GM has still sat back and gone, you still failed. You all fail. You're all useless. You don't want that. You don't want your players to feel as if everything that they've done is for nothing. And yet, this man here keeps saying that it's entirely up to you as to the outcome of the battle. So what you do is you start to introduce NPC villains. 
These are little sub-villains, they're not major villains, villains that the PCs can take on and can attack throughout the combat. So at the very beginning, they see this noble individual riding on top of the tank. And he seems to see them, even though it's a mile across the, the battlefield, and he raises his saber and points it directly at the PCs. And you get the sense that he's challenging you. So those are moments that you set up. And you make damn sure, because it's a seed, you make sure that that grows and that they come across that PC, NPC several times. They can succeed against him, but he escapes. They can fail against him, but he escapes. But if his army triumphs in the end, the final battle before the retreat is sounded must be the PCs defeating that minor NPC, defeating that villain. So that they get a sense of accomplishment, that they thwarted it, even though they lost the battle, they won this little skirmish. They won this personal vendetta against this NPC that has been goading them throughout the entire situation. So that then when they retreat, there is a sense of victory. Now what you also do is that you give them a bigger NPC, someone that they can't get to because they're too well protected, preferably, or that they're just never around, or that they're there in whispers only. You give them the bigger enemy, the enemy who launched this attack, and that, by causing them to then have to withdraw from the battle, from, retreat from the battleground, that then becomes the focus of the rest of their adventure, and it gives them something to hate and to look against, rather than to rally against the GM who just made an arbitrary call. Now, if you really want to add numbers, you can. And it's a modifier that you can come up with. Well, the NPCs succeeded. Right, they get plus one on their roll, or the enemy gets minus one on their roll. Whoever rolls higher between the, PC, the, the good side and the bad side, or the neutral and the neutral side, whatever you want to call them, whoever rolls higher succeeds and 10% of their numbers are dropped. If you really want numbers, that's, for me, the simplest way of doing it, is using the PC successes to determine the roles. And sometimes the outcomes don't have the exact role that you want. But again, it's about making sure that the PCs feel that they have succeeded, even though they have lost the battle, they have succeeded somewhere along the line, and that the war is far from over, and that there are options for them to gain victories during that oncoming uh, future war. Those are my thoughts on how to make mass combat that much more interesting, that much more engaging, and that much more fun for the players to participate in and for you as the GM to run rather than just trying to crunch numbers and calculate a statistical outcome. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can join us on Patreon for more discussions along these lines. We've got an exclusive Facebook page. And of course, the Patreons get exclusive videos every week as well, which uh, go generally deeper into the topics that are covered by these videos. Either way, whatever your choice, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming. <laughs>